How's everybody doing tonight? Hope you're doing well. I'm glad to have you here. This is our eighth episode of Uncle's Throwback Thursdays, and I appreciate everybody that tunes in every week. Uh, to watch our show, I try to, uh, to find some of the best talent uh, that I can, and uh, let me flip this thing. It's always a little banners pop up. Uh, I always try to find the best talent I can, and the shows have been really good. Show uh, last week with uh, pro wrestler uh, Ricky Steamboat really seemed to go well. And uh, Ricky was on for nearly two hours last week and, and really enjoyed having him. Uh, I learned a lot, a lot about wrestling uh, that I didn't know. And, uh, you know, it's good to have somebody uh, in, in both fields that, that uh, you know, that can, you know, once they retire, I guess they can tell you a little bit. And uh, Ricky did just that, and I learned a lot. A lot of fun. Uh, see what's going on. Oh, yeah, I've had my second COVID vaccine yesterday. And I think I was told I was supposed to be in the bed real sick and everything, but I've been out, uh, been out working on my truck. I actually put a uh, new in-dash stereo system in, in my truck and... Uh, you know, don't try to go to church and put in a uh, car stereo because you'll definitely have to be calling the preacher back up during the week. Uh, I tried not to cuss too much, but sometimes sometimes it slips after you drop a, a two or three screws down the air conditioning vents that's meant for the radio. So uh, anyway... I've been messing with that all day, and I've not felt bad at all. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't feel bad with the first one, but everybody said, oh, yeah, the second one's really going to knock you a flip. And I had to think about it today. I, I said, oh, yeah, I had I had my COVID shot yesterday. So don't be scared of those things. Uh, don't pay your attention to everything you read on Facebook about, about these vaccines. Everybody needs them. And... Uh, you know, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get us back uh, to the normal things if everyone wants to get back to going to festivals and, and, and living uh, in, you know, in this free country we have right now to be able to do the things we do. And a lot of things that have been taken for granted by not being able to uh, get out and do things. I mean, going out to eat and going to bluegrass festivals, doing things with your friends. Just all that stuff. I'm looking forward to it coming back. You can start with a vaccine. I know a lot of people is going to disagree with me, but there's just too much politics involved in this. And uh, you know, I I know I know it's the right thing, right thing for me. So anyway, did that this week. Uh, I want to mention to everybody that uh, all these episodes you can go to my YouTube channel. Just put in Phil Ledbetter channel on YouTube and you can watch all the uh, the back ones that uh, are on are on there and uh, let's see what else I need to tell you um, hmm. I think that's probably a little bit of it right now uh, we've we've been having some really good guests now next week I've got a really good guest uh, I've got uh, John uh, Dietrich and he's the drummer with Restless Heart he's a founded member of that band uh, all those guys, I mean, are equally important in that band because they are so, such. A, in my opinion, they're one of the very best live bands I have ever seen. And I first saw them in probably 89, 1990, maybe 90, something like that, at a place called Starwood Amphitheater in Nashville. And uh, they just blew, they blew my socks off how good they were. And I've got to know... John really good, and uh, you know some of the other guys in the band. They're a bunch of good guys, bunch of great musicians. Uh, I know that they were studio musicians, so uh, that kind of explains why they're so good. They play all their own stuff on their records and don't bring have, have to bring in uh, session guys uh, because they are session guys. So tune in next week, John has just retired from uh, Restless Heart after being there from the first. And I know we can get some good stories from him. And if you're a Restless Heart fan, be sure and tune in. 
And even if you're not tuned in, you will be after you talk to John, hear John talk for a while. So uh, anyway, that's next week. This week, I got my buddy, uh, Grammy winner, uh, amazing artist, singer, uh, equally good writer. Uh, he's wrote so many songs. Uh, we'll talk about them with him, but uh, Two Pina Coladas, he wrote that for Garth Brooks. I wrote it and Garth recorded it, I guess was a thing. Uh, How Long Gone Are You Gonna Be that Brooks and Dunn had out? Uh, let me think here. Um, um, let me think. Uh, oh, yeah. Nobody But Me, Blake Shelton. That's a, another person that if they record your music, you're going to make a little bit of money. Uh, River of Love. That was a uh, George Strait tune. He wrote that. He wrote so many. We'll talk about a bunch of uh, his tunes. Uh, Would You Go With Me uh, with Josh Turner was another one. So we're going to talk about all this. He's going to call in here in a little bit. Uh, I really think, think the world of this guy. I met him a week before I moved to Nashville, and uh, I was at a jam session. And we'll talk, we'll talk about that a little bit. But, you know... Uh, he had came in to play fiddle uh, at this jam, and and just something about him when I first saw him and met him, he's got real real good charisma. Uh, his charisma is really, really uh, off the charts. Really, really good guy. Uh, just you know, uh, makes you feel comfortable when you're around him. And uh, his gig right now is uh, the front guy with the band called the Earls of Lester. And that's where he won his Grammy with that bunch. Uh, Jerry Douglas kind of heads that band up, but you couldn't do anything without Sean. Sean's the the voice of that band, and uh, he does a really good Lester flat. So I, I see if we can get him to do a little Lester on here tonight, uh, if I don't forget about it. But uh, anyway, I hope all you guys have had a good had a good week so far been really nice here today it's been up up uh, up around 70 i guess and uh you know it's kind of a, a a good change from all the ice we were having the last week and stuff but i'm ready for spring i'm ready for everything to start blooming i i, I like spring spring and summer is my seasons uh winter the first snow i like and if it snows on christmas I'm good. After that, I'm ready for it. December 26th, I'm ready for it to be 80 degrees. That's me. Uh, or or 70, anyway. Uh, and that has happened before. I know when I was a teenager, we had one Christmas that it was nearly 80 degrees, and we were all out in the yard uh, celebrating Christmas and throwing footballs around with the neighbors. So, uh, anyway, this weather's kind of weird, but but uh, hang in there. We'll get some good weather here real soon. And uh, anyway, I'm trying to think of some other stuff I want to talk to you about. Oh, yeah, I've told you about this uh, record I'm doing, this Dobro record. It really is uh, doing really good. We've got all the tracks in right now. We have, uh, without counting, I think we have 25 players, which is incredible. Uh, I already have all their tracks and their bios. And uh, I'm going to also add what kind of instruments they're playing because a lot of these Dobro guys, they like to know that. Uh, they'll look at that and see and say, well, I need to go buy one of those. That sounds really good. So, uh, you know, it helps the builders and helps the, uh, the res resonator guitar industry, which for you folks that uh, don't know about the Dobros, Dobro was a trademark. So I guess it, the real name of it, the for all the instruments across the board are called resonator guitars. But, you know, I still call them a dobro. They've always been a dobro with me and uh, probably always will be. So uh, when you hear resonator guitar, resophonic guitar, that that's a dobro. That's what that is. Just like my hat here, dobro hat. I wear that because uh, they're not making those anymore. And uh, Gibson still has a trademark, and I've heard they may start building them again. But this hat is washed out a little bit, but Mike Aldridge signed this hat, and uh, it's always been real important, uh, real 
uh, real important to me because I was a big fan of Mike Aldridge and one of the greatest dobro players in the world. And, uh, you know, speaking of that, doing this uh, dobro sessions uh, record, or it's not a dobro sessions, it's, we don't have a name for it yet, but it's a big do dobro project that works. I've, I've got to talk quite a bit to a lot of guys that, uh, you know, weren't really in my orbit as far as playing where we played. People like Leroy Mack and and uh, Curtis Birch and folks like that that uh, I don't see out on the circuit. And I've got to talk to those guys a lot and be friends. And, uh, you know, something about a record like this, looking forward to it and seeing what it's going to do. But I'm really enjoying most of all the new uh, friendships I've got with players that I've always known, but just, you know, hadn't talked to or anything. You know, I gotta get, I just now realized I've got to get this phone ready for Sean to call in. Wait just a minute. Give me a second here. Should have known better. Always, always me. Got new telephone, so I hope I'm doing it right. I think I am. Yeah, I think I am. All right. Well. I thought I was all prepared. Now we're getting all, all my um, my voice messages, but Sean will call in here in just a few minutes. But anyway, I about forgot that. I always forget something every time, whether it's to put my microphone on or something like that. Uh, and I think we're ready to go. Let me just make sure on this that, that I, yeah, I'm ready to go when he calls. But anyway, uh, it's about that time we talk that the season, festival seasons are getting ready to pick up. Uh, they're going to be limited, I know, for a while, but, you know, if you can, get out and go to festivals. You know, you can do distancing at those, and you're outdoor. It's another big thing about it. Being outdoor just really clears everything up as opposed to being inside. Now, you still get this stuff, but, you know, if you go to a festival and don't get in people's faces and all, do that and, and support these festival promoters that still trying to have shows because they're losing their butts on a lot of stuff and they need you to come out. And the bands are really, really itching. I'm one of those to get, to get it back out and play. So uh, anyway, if you see a festival that looks pretty good, uh, check it out. The bands need it. The promoters need it. And hopefully next year we'll be back like it used to be, I hope, but I think, I said this last year, I said this year would be all back to normal, and, and it's not yet, so, uh, yeah, anyway, just, uh, you know, support, support your bands and your promoters as much as you can, and uh, I know they'll appreciate that, and let's see if there's any other news I need to tell you of the week, oh, yeah, uh, some of you guys on Facebook may have saw where my wife asked me to cut her hair. And those of you that know me, I, I, I'm blind in my left eye uh, temporarily. Or this temporary has been five years now. But I'm getting a new corneal trans, or not transplant, but getting some calcium took off and I'll be able to see. But right now I'm totally blind. So she wants me to take a half an inch off her hair at the bottom and... Uh, I took four inches off, and uh, you know that's not good. I had to, I had to get out of the house quick. But I came back with a milkshake, and sometimes that that helps a little bit to make things better. So anyway, it's all good now. Uh, she told me she'd never let me cut her hair again, and that's good because I, I, I don't want to be a barber, you know, and I'm not a barber. So uh, anyway, that was uh, some big news around our house, the, the hair cutting incident. Let me see who I've got online over here. Uh, Debbie Cantwell's on every week. Debbie, I appreciate you. You're, you're such a good one. You're always on. And uh, my buddy Donna Sullivan. If I had a sister, it would be Donna. I, well, I've got a, I, got a, I had three sisters, but if I had another one, it'd be Donna. I really, really thank the world of her. She's my buddy, and uh, she does uh, management for Dell and Bradley. 
and uh, on the phone there, it's coming from a private number. Let's see who this is. Is this you, Sean? Yeah. Hey, buddy, you're on there. Hey. How you doing? I am. You are. Hey, Phil. Hey, buddy. Good to have you on hey. tonight. I've been talking you up quite a bit. Well, it's it's good to be on here with you, brother. Great to, great to see you on here, and you're sounding good tonight. It's great to hear your voice, man. Well, thank you, buddy. I'm I'm doing a lot better. I, I'm you know, it's, all my cancer's been in remission for uh, a couple of no no not not a couple, maybe a little over a year now, and I'm starting to feel yeah. normal. So I just hope it don't jump back up on me again and kick me back down, but. But, well, praise the Lord on that, man. I'm 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 happy for you, and and you know everybody loves you. And, uh, I just you. can't wait till I can get over there to your area there, and I can get me a haircut. That's what my problem. Is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, buddy, I'll make you look good. I mean, if you just need I know it. it. If you're looking, you know, if you're looking to be, you know, if you're looking for a bird, just tell me you want uh, half an inch <laughs> off. Hey, I haven't been in a barber chair since uh, December 11th of uh, 2019, and I had a short haircut. You know, <laughs> old Kent Blanton been cutting my hair. Oh like yeah, the sure. Superman, the bass sure. player, and I took my daddy over there, and we both got a haircut. And had a great time, but uh, then you know, about time for me to get another haircut. COVID, COVID broke out. And yeah. I stayed in the woods. I haven't been to the, I haven't been to the barber yet. So well, I've I've, I've I've not been since 2011 because what's funny is when I started on chemo, all my well all my hair was I was I I didn't have a lot of hair anyway, but all of it came out. And uh, I used to like to go to my barber. You know, it's more of a thing about socializing, go visit really. Uh, with your barber and uh, right, I didn't yeah. have much to cut, but I always like going in talking to the guys in there. You know, they'd be talking about, you know, all the things that really don't interest women most of the time, and That's uh, right. and it's a uh, you know, so I've not had one. Uh, my, you know, I let my wife cut my hair because she's pretty good at it and she can see pretty good. And even if she cuts yeah. off half an inch of my hair, that's all I got anyway. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that gets me where I want to be. But, buddy, yeah. good, good to have you on tonight. I, You know, Sean, well, I, I, I'm, I'm really am. And I, I, know, I know a lot about you because, uh, you know, I've kept up with you uh, through the years. Right. And, uh, you know, I first met you at, uh, and we've talked about this, but I first met you at Mike Scott's house. He had a jam session. And I remember that. Yes, sir. About 19, maybe 89 or 90, 89? Um, I, I don't know. It might have been 80, 80. Uh, uh, okay. Eight, I, I moved to Nashville in January of 87 and uh, okay. went to work fiddling for the Osborne Brothers when I got here. Yeah, you know? I remember that. But, but uh, I, I always loved Mike, and, and that was, a, that was a, neat, a neat night for me to get to hear you and Huh. Uh, you you really are one of the best dobro players on earth. You oh, know? Sean! And, uh, yeah. you, seriously, well, you, I'm bluegrass. You're the you're the dobro player of the year right now, aren't you? Uh, I lost this year, uh, Justin you Moses. Did? Yeah, I won it in 2019. I won it in in 05, 14, and 19. So wow, man, well, that's that's pretty high um, cotton right there. Buddy, yeah, you but know? you know what, man. I'm glad to be the age I am because there's. I was talking to a guy named uh, Leroy Mack. Do you know Leroy? Who he is? I don't believe so. I don't. Leroy played with a, a band called the Kentucky, the Kentucky Colonels, the with Clarence White. And, oh, okay, yeah. And they they were on the Andy Griffith show. They called themselves the Country Boys on there. Oh. And uh, I was talking to Curtis tonight about you know good to be my age because man these new breed of dobro players out there are just eating it up and you know there's just so many kids on all these instruments now because you can go on youtube and learn how to play them right and yeah when we started we had to pick up the needle on the record back it up <laughs> back it up and hope 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 you can get close to it. get close but yeah. you know every 
every generation gets a lot better, it seems like. It does. It does. Did you have, ever have to put the pennies on your uh, record arm to keep it from bouncing and skipping? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we... You know, I, I, we didn't, we were pretty poor growing up, so, uh, you know, we didn't have any quarters, so I'd have to put about 25 pennies on mine, you know, because we didn't have, we, and I don't think I saw a dollar till I was a teenager. See, I, I, was, imp I was impressed what they looked like, <laughs> but no, I, we, we come up, we didn't come up super good, but we, we, we were all right, you know, but, yeah. uh, you know, I want to talk to you a little bit. You're, uh, I know you're from Perryville, Arkansas. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Tell me a little bit uh, about that, because uh, uh, I know you played with uh, uh, Roger King and what Grand Prairie Boys. Yes, I did, and uh, <clears throat> um, I I started with them when I was about sixteen, I guess, mm -hmm. um, um, and uh, worked with them for a couple of years, and and had a great time with all those boys, and. Um, Roger's a great dobro player and, mm -hmm. and one of the first songwriters I was around too. Wow. He was writing songs before I was. Uh, the other guy I knew in, in Arkansas that wrote songs was a professor in UCA in Conway. His name was Farrell Simpson and he wrote a lot of songs. And me and my daddy actually were in a little band that he had called Oakry. We uh, we didn't play with him too long, but I was just learning and and um, and uh, and daddy daddy played guitar with us and. Um, um, then I then I went to work with uh, the Grand Prairie Boys and and uh, we toured around a couple of years. Then I went to McAllister, Oklahoma, and hooked up with Freddie Sanders, oh, another yeah. uh, mm -hmm. legendary dobro man. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, I, then then I ended up getting with the Osborne Brothers and moving to Nashville. So. You've really you've really uh, made a lot of. Uh of good things while you've been in Nashville. I mean, you've really became one of the very top songwriters uh, down there, I think. And I can hear a song, well, buddy, I can hear a song a lot of times on a demo or whatever, even if somebody else is singing it, uh, or even on the radio, and I can listen and I can easily say, you know, that sounds a lot like something Sean wrote. Because uh, you, write, oh, you write really, you write deep stuff and Oh, thank you, brother. And uh, you know, I'm just so proud of you with all you all you've done. Uh, a few things I know you you uh, did. Uh, how long gone are you going to be for Brooks and Dunn? Did you write that all by yes. yourself? Oh no, I, I had a, uh, a buddy, my buddy John Scott Sherrill, and I we wrote that together. And he mm -hmm. he wrote Wild and Blue for John Anderson. He wrote a bunch of great hits, mm -hmm. uh, Holding On to Nothing But the Wheel for mm -hmm. Patty Loveless. Mm -hmm. But John Scott and I wrote How Long Gone, and we also wrote Would You Go With Me for Josh Turner. Wow, yeah. that's one of my favorite Those, songs. Well, thank you, man. It, it it was fun fun song to write. I recorded it on my Fireball album, which mm -hmm. was you're, actually my last studio album. Man, your that's version something. is awesome on that, Sean. It really well, is. thank you. It's my yeah, man, I, I wrote that with John Scott, with, uh, with uh, Sam Bush and Newgrass Revival in mm -hmm. mind. That was... In my, my mind's eye, that was who I was shooting for to have those guys get back together and cut that, you mm -hmm. know. And mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't have a chorus on that song. And uh, it just kind of went to this E minor kind of weird uh, newgrass style jam, you know, for uh, instead of having a chorus. And, and Josh Turner's producer called and said, well, they they'd cut a couple of other things of mine and, and, they, and they were interested in that song but wanted to or to know if I would add a chorus to it or something. And so I got with John Scott, Cheryl, and, and we wrote us, wrote us a chorus for it, and, and they did it. So, you know, about 95% of the time if somebody asks you to do something specific to a song and they'll record it, they won't do it. But Josh did record it, and uh, I think we improved the song by adding that chorus to it, you know. Hey, man, that's a great song. And, you know, first time I heard it, you know, I uh, it was definitely new grass sounding because it, you know, first I thought that was Sam Bush, but that's Aubrey, isn't it? Aubrey Haney playing mandolin. Yeah, Aubrey's on Josh's record of it. Yeah. Yeah, man, he sound he, he sounds just like Sam on it. Oh man. yeah, he can he can do it. He can he can pull it off. He's a fine fiddler too. Yeah. Oh yeah, he sure is. Uh, let's see now. Uh, 
How about uh, two pina coladas? Tell me about that. Well, I was writing with Sandy Mason uh, and Benita Hill, and and um, we we couldn't come up with anything to write, and uh, uh, we 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 left the writing room, walked out on the porch, sat on the porch, and I I remember kicking my feet in the gravel in the driveway there off the porch, you know, and thinking this just ain't gonna work today. I ain't gonna come up with nothing, you know, and. Uh, <laughs> I said, girls, we just need to forget this songwriting and go to Florida. And Sandy said, well, if I go to Florida, I'm getting a pina colada. And Benita said, well, I want one for each hand. And <laughs> so we wrote the chorus right there just laughing, you know, in about, you know, five minutes we had the chorus. And um, wow. uh, and we knew we had something. And we went in and finished the little song. And 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 really, I didn't think it was that great a song, uh, you know, and uh, – but it just happened to be that we thought Jim, well, Jimmy Buffett was looking for songs that week, and we thought if we could just get it to Jimmy. Mm-hmm. We might have mm-hmm. a chance of getting it cut, you know? Sure. And, uh, and uh, Sandy Mason, uh, she rest her soul, she's gone on now, but she uh, she had an ear with Alan Reynolds. You know, she was that was her uh, that was her sweetheart. She was there, and she played the work tape to him that mm-hmm. night. Well, Alan, Garth Brooks' producer, and mm-hmm. Alan said, well, let me hear that again. He did. He listened to it half a dozen times and said, "I want to play that for Garth." And so, within a week, we recorded that with him. And um, within about a month, it was it was out. And it was a single, man. And this wow. was the quickest, the quickest thing I'd ever seen in town. You know, I bet that blew your mind, didn't it? To have it really because yeah. Garth was Garth was really peaking about that time too, wasn't he? I mean, when he recorded he that. Was. So. He put that on Seven's album, and he, he recorded another song of mine uh, and uh, uh, Taylor Dunn, a buddy of mine, the co-wrote a ballad that he recorded, and, and he recorded the uh, Seven's album, mm-hmm. and that's the one that those two were on. And What's the name the of same, it, the second one? Uh, the, the, the second one's called I Don't Have to Wonder, and uh, uh, it's a really nice tune, and he, he shot, Garth shot a video on it i think he spent a half million dollars on the video <laughs> and he never released it as a single really so, yeah but um, and garth can do that i guess you know we got so excited thing oh man we're gonna get a single out of this he just got a video and then he never released it but uh wow it's on it's on the video box set he, he sells you know but uh, he's um but, when you can get one to him and get it cut that's a big deal <laughs> right there well it's it, it it bought a lot of beans and taters, I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, oh, I, oh, I can imagine that, you know. Uh, um, let's see, you wrote, uh, you wrote uh, How Long Gone Are You Gonna Be for uh, Brooks and Dunn. Did we talk about that one? We did with the, with John Scott Sherrill. And then, uh, yeah. let's see, uh, what else? R- River of Love was a little thing with jo- George, George Strait, Strait and yep. Billy Burnett and... Uh, Dennis Morgan and I, the three of us wrote that, but, um, shoot, I don't know, man. You wrote, uh, growing for Blake Shelton, too, didn't you? Yeah. Nobody but me. Uh, yep. it was a pretty good hit. Me and Philip White wrote that. And Philip's from down Muscle Shoals. He's, mm-hmm. uh, he's great, great lyricist. And, uh, he's writing down there these days and living down there again. Uh, uh, it, it did all right for us. Well, while we're talking about country music, let's talk about a few things here. Uh, you and Willie are pretty good buddies, aren't you? <clears throat> well, I'll, we know each other sometimes. Know each I, other, he, yeah. <laughs> he calls me the old horse thief. I, I, I was on the, I was down there. I was up in New York City uh, to play a, a little TV run with him and uh, with the Buddy Cannon's band. The record band and uh, uh, I was hanging out at Radio City Music Hall and he was playing with Allison Krauss well at the mm-hmm. end of the show Willie walks out to the edge of the stage and everybody from the wings comes up, comes on stage to sing along on his gospel set you know and, uh, 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 Mickey Raphael sees me standing there and he said pick Willie's guitar just go and play Willie's and I said no no I ain't going to do that he said go ahead Willie don't care you know mm-hmm. uh, alright alright I played it for a minute and and at the end of the of the show, uh, Willie's guy that takes care of his guitar ran out like, "Who are you?" He didn't know me, you know. Mm-hmm. And so uh, 
everybody, he gave me so much grief about playing his guitar, and, and Mickey Raphael just set me up, you know, <laughs> to make, make, make everybody, you know, set me up with Willie, just to mess with me. So now Willie calls me the old horse thief. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, I stole Trigger for a minute. You know. That guitar of his has been through, been through the mill, hasn't it? It has, man. They're holding it together with duct tape, I think. <laughs> well, let's move to another one here. I know you uh, have spent a lot of time with Loretta Lynn. I've written quite a few songs with her. I haven't heard from her lately, but uh, she's uh, she's an amazing uh, writer. When I was writing with her, she was still on fire, you know, mm-hmm. and still singing. I, I guess I recorded I don't know, 70 or 80 songs with her uh-huh. uh, in a batch of the last 100, 100 songs that wow. she recorded, I guess, you know. So um, there'll be things coming out for years to come that I played on with her, you know. And Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. Pretty pretty neat. She was, she's, she's an amazing uh, hero to a lot of folks. Mm-hmm. She's like a female Hank Williams in, in my oh, mind. Yeah, you know? there's no doubt. I only got to meet her once and at that time, um, I'd been playing with the Whites, and, and Cheryl and Sharon said, hey, come over here with us a minute, and I guess she was even off limits for the backstage, but they took me back uh, into another room to meet her, and she was just so nice. And uh, She's a sweetheart. She really is. She just got out of the hospital when, when we met her, and she was just, you know, you would never know it because she, I guess, yeah. been at the Opry, she knows how to turn that on and she flips the switch, yeah. you know. But uh, I knew you'd been yeah. doing some stuff with her. And let's see. Um, I'm, trying to th- I'm trying to think. I had you in- another question. But anyway, we're going to move, move on to the uh, Bluegrass here uh, at the Earls of Leicester. Let's talk about... Before we talk about them, tell, tell, who were some bands growing up that uh, bluegrass bands that influenced you that you liked to hear or you you know kept in your cassette player back then? Oh man, well Bill Monroe and you know Jim Jimmy Martin and mm-hmm. Jim and Jesse and uh, the Osborne brothers for sure. You know, but well Monroe really was the the guy in flat and scrubs i mean all mm-hmm. that, that the, all the whole crew you know so i uh i had records of all those guys growing up and uh, uh really bill monroe from early on he was oh, the yeah. one i really started with mm-hmm. you know and uh and he was my grandpa's favorite um you know singer of all times you know so wow. uh, uh i just always loved that stuff and and uh Felt a, you know, felt like that's that's where my heart is, you know, and, and sure. acoustic music. Sure, sure. Uh, well, but I, I, a lot of local Arkansas folks too, you know, we, we used to listen to you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, Sean, how old were you when you started playing? Well, I started playing guitar, chords, and stuff when I was five. Jeez. And, uh, and mandolin at seven. Man, and when I was about twelve. Uh, we had a picking party at the house, and this uh, this old man played harmonica up in Perry County, mm-hmm. Arkansas. And he came to the house. Mm-hmm. His name was Lige McDonald, and Lige had a uh, had a fiddle under his arm when he came in there, and he left it laying over on the couch. And uh, uh, he had me go over there and mess around with it. So I learned a little bit. And before the night was over, I played Over the Waves for him, you know, and this fiddle that I oh. never played. I, I played a little mandolin, you know, but uh, he said, you ought to just go ahead and keep that fiddle and learn how to play it. And I, I was thrilled to death, you know, and it was his wife's fiddle, really, he mm-hmm. said. But uh, I, after two days, Mama mama said, after <laughs> after hearing me screech, screech and screech, all around on that fiddle. She said, you go in there and get that fiddle. We're going to Lige McDonald's house. <laughs> so she loaded me up and we went to Lige's house and I had to go up and knock on the door and say, I got to give you your fiddle back. So I didn't see a fiddle till <laughs> I was 15 at Christmas on, when I was 15. Uh, uh, I heard Daddy sawing on the fiddle in the back room and I thought it was a bagpipe he had bought me for Christmas. Uh-huh. 
<laughs> but it was a fiddle. So I started really playing, and about six months later, I was working in local uh, country bands and yeah. around Benton, Benton and Little Rock. Uh, that fiddles, fiddle players are hard to find, you know, sometimes. Oh. So I think they were desperate for a fiddle. Oh, you know? you know, dobro players, when I started, you could go to any jam sessions, and at the time that I started, if you were a banjo player, they would they would kind of flag you off. They didn't want you because there was banjo players hanging out of the trees that uh, people always <laughs> said. But dobro players was rare, so I could go to a jam session, and they'd always take me in and, you know, let me yeah. play. And uh, I had mentioned, I think once on here, but I started playing when I was, I think I was 12. Uh, 11 or yeah. 12, and uh, I was always a big fan of Josh Graves, and uh, yeah. anyway, he came into town one night, and I've never been able to really tell this full story, but I can tell it, or not, it's I'm not the long story, but I can tell you uh, some parts I'd left out when I told this to, you know, other people, but uh, we're on, on the internet, so I guess we're talking to a bunch, but uh, I, I went to see him, and I only knew one song. And uh, I, but I wanted to see Josh, and I had had a head full of hair back then. And uh, yeah. that day, I didn't. It, I I never needed much of an excuse not to go to school. I mean, one quarter. I'm I'm <laughs> hands up on this. Missed forty four days. And I've still yeah. got my report card on that. It's all F's. Had six F's wow. even, even in gym. So. Uh, Anyway, uh, I went to see Josh that night, and like I said, I only knew one song. And uh, I go, you know, into the theater, and somebody said, hey, they saw Josh just pull up, and he's in the building. So I ran. His part I couldn't really tell people. I ran to the bathroom, make sure my hair was good. And I, <laughs> I had hair, and I hit that door, and it goes about a foot, and I hear somebody's cuss start cussing, hey, blank, 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 blank. <laughs> well, I ease in there, and Josh is down on his all fours throwing up in the toilet. Oh. Oh, yeah. So, uh, anyway, uh, I guess he had he'd been drinking too much Christmas punch or something coming down. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, being a kid, first thing I did is Josh is down, and you know men's toilets. I mean, guys miss them pretty bad. I mean, they're always pretty nasty around the bottom. Josh had his hands down in that throwing up, and uh, oh. and I come in, I just threw my hand out at him, say, hey, Josh, my name's Phil, and want to meet you. Josh reached up and shook my hand, and I remember, oh, no. oh yeah, man, I remember my hand sticking to his, and uh, <laughs> and I told somebody that story like the next week, and they said, oh, you got to meet Josh and shake his hand. I bet you didn't wash that hand all week, did you? And I said, man, I washed that hand as soon as I was able to step over Josh and get to the sink. So a lot of people didn't know that, but that was my, my first meeting and he got me on stage and and I only knew shucking the corn. And uh, he he says, uh, what do you want to do? And I said, uh, well, let's do shucking the corn. So we do that and Josh says, uh, well, Hey, I enjoyed that. Let's do another one. And I said, man, look, I bought tickets to see you now. I'm going to go sit down and you sit up here and play and let me watch you. Because I didn't oh. know anything else. But uh, I'll never yeah. forget that, you know. Uh, I bet. Uh, I, I don't think I'll ever forget that. Now, you know, I didn't realize <laughs> then how the how how hard the old timers were, <laughs> you know. Uh, well, he was probably hoping you'd stay up there and play the whole show so he wouldn't have to play. <laughs> he didn't want that. It would have been the same song it, over and over. Um, well, I've got, you know, I bought a, an old Regal Dobro hmm. that was uh, that he signed in inside the body. It says, uh, Uncle Josh, uh, wow. 1960 Flat and Scruggs inside the body. Jeez. And, uh, and it's his autograph, you know. I mean, you can tell it's his writing, you know. And oh, I, I, I bought it over here at Fairview, Tennessee. It was mm -hmm. a little, there was a little music guitar store in there, and, mm -hmm. and I just happened upon it. And uh, I wasn't in the market to buy one, really, mm -hmm. but but I took it home and and, and I took it and showed Jerry, and he took it, Bucks uh, set it up for me. And man, it's it plays like like a like a the best one I've ever seen. You know, it's, man, it's that's like awesome. He, 
Jerry thinks it's probably a 1934 Regal is what well, he said, you know. So he uh, tried to trade you out of it? Well, not yet, but it ain't over <laughs> yet, you know. <laughs> Man, that's nice. I mean, that's a that's a killer pawn shop find right there, Sean. Yeah, I'm tickled to have it, and I, I'll have to bring it up there and let you play it one of these Oh, you don't want to do that. Are you playing it slide, or are you playing it guitar? I try to play a little slide, but you know what that's I awesome. did this, this last year? I bought a Gibson console grand double neck eight string, just like Don Helms steel. Wow. Play with Hank Williams. And I've been learning to play that thing a little bit. I'm not great at all, but I just wanted to feel what yeah. it sounds like to have that tone in my hand. Man, you know? yeah. And, and it's an amazing thing. I've got an old Fender uh, Pro amp from the early 50s, oh, man. which was the model that he used. And uh, it's been a real treat to to just sit down and play Cold, Cold, Hard or some of those things that Hank Gosh, used to yeah. do. Um, it's been fun to stay around the house for that you know, in, in itself, really, just laying low during the pandemic yeah, and sure. not having to get up and leave, you know. So. You know, I've, I've owned, I've tried, I've tried three times with a steel, and the first time uh, I got one, my neighbor was in Hendersonville, and Tommy White, you know Tommy? Oh, uh, he's great. Yeah, uh, he's he's awesome. Uh, but Tommy was, uh, lived down the road from me, and for folks that don't know Tommy, he's the a staff opera still player down. He's been on everything, but he had a uh, he had a Showbud Pro Two, and he wanted the Dobro because he was playing with the Whites at the time. So yeah. uh, I had this pre-war uh, guitar, and I traded it to him for this double neck uh, uh, Showbud, and uh, I messed yeah. with it for about about a week, and it started making sense. My problem. When I go back to Dobro, it would mess me up because of the spacing. But uh, right. I still started getting it down a little bit. And then one day I blew it engine in my car about a week after I bought that steel and had to go sell it. So, uh, oh, you know, man. but I bought another one later and, and I just found out that it was hard for me to go from back from from Dobro to steel or whatever. and. Does, well, it'd be hard for me to go too if anybody heard me. <laughs> but, I don't know I'm about that. Myself. I don't know about that. I'm out in the middle of the woods, you know, so no, I, I, I don't can know make about that. <laughs> does now I've not asked him, but does 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 Jerry play any steel? He's got uh, he's got a steel, and I can't remember what it was. He, you know, uh, uh, Lloyd Green. I think he he got one of Lloyd Green steels. One of the, uh, one of the green ones. Yeah, I, I can't remember what it was. I don't think oh. it's a green one, but I, I think it might have been something that Lloyd set hooked him up with. Wow, you know, but that's killer. He tried for a while, but I think he just decided that he didn't want to mess with it. He plays a lot of lap steel and stuff. Oh yeah, I knew one. that. Yeah, uh, and different tunings too. I mean, oh, yeah. he's a genius. That's oh, all. Oh, I know, to. Jerry. I went down and saw him. Uh, oh, it's been several months back. Uh, when the COVID started. And he right. he had a Dobro that he got uh, that I used to own, so I went down to buy that back. It was an RQ Jones just oh. like his. And oh yeah. Man. Anyway, I got it back, but while I was down there, he was with, over there opening cases, showing us all these lap steels. And uh, oh yeah. But the one that's got the I guess it's the Corvette or something uh, uh -huh. hubcap on Hail. the top. Uh, have you yeah. seen that one? It's got the hubcap that they've made the cover oh, yeah. plate with. That, I, I went over and did that uh, uh, transatlantic sessions tour with him oh, yeah. the year before last, and uh, and he played that with that band over there. It had the fin on it. I think it wasn't a tail fin on it. Yeah, or something. it's got a tail fin too, and the cover plate is a hubcap yeah. with the mast out yeah. flat. And uh, right. And anyway, let me let me see. Hey, Sean, I need to plug my. Let me check check my plug on my computer real quick oh, because okay. it's giving me a. Uh, a bad light here. Just a minute. I gotta step out of yeah, here. I've not, I'm not done this before, but just bear with me. All right. Coming right at you. No, no hurry. <laughs> Looks like we've got a pretty good audience out there. Yeah, there's. They always tune in quite a bit uh, here to, uh, especially tonight, man. A lot of people wanted to see you. 
And I don't know about that. Hey, you're a big hitter, man. Uh, it's good to have you on. And uh, uh, let's talk you, about let's talk about the Earls of Leicester a little bit now. You guys won a Grammy, but tell me about how that band got together and and let everybody know who the members are in that band and stuff. Well, uh, initially, uh, uh, Johnny Warren and Charlie Cushman were cutting a record, and they did all those banjo fiddle records, you know, like like Johnny Johnny's dad, uh, Paul and uh, and Earl used to play stuff together, you know, and they did all that. So they called Jerry Douglas to go over and play on that record, and somewhere in during that time, they kind of conjured up a the idea to do a flat and scrubs type band, you know. And I think uh, they got hold of Tim O'Brien, Tim, and Tim was going to be Curly, and uh, Barry Bales. He got a, Jerry used Barry, you know. So uh, then they they were going to have Del Del uh, McCurry sing on it. I think. Oh yeah. It. And something happened that it didn't work out. And um, Jerry didn't know what to do. And uh, his wife, Jill, said, why don't you try Sean Camp? And he said, well, all right. And he called me. And he said, uh, you know, we're putting together this Flat and Scruggs band and want to know if you might want to be Lester. And I said, why, well, hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> you are the best so, Lester and the best person <laughs> they could have ever picked. I don't know about that. but it No, was you fun, are, man. You know? <laughs> and we all oh, thank you, man. But first, re, first get get together we had. I went in there with my with a pinstripe suit on and a, and a fedora, and uh and and a tie. Walked in there in in uh -huh. character, you know. And uh, we played about eight bars in, into something. And man, I had stopped the band because it was like uh, so close to the record. Really, you know, I'd never been in a jam session that well, that everybody that. was actually feeling like that you know and mm -hmm. it just kind of made my hair stand up and, and you know we we had a good time there for a while and uh and cut our cut the first album with tim o'brien still in the band and then he started working with uh hot rise a lot right and it ended up he couldn't go on the road and and it just kind of we had a revolving curly secular seat for <laughs> you know a year or so there yeah and uh, now we got Jeff White. And Jeff Skiller. Yeah, he's great. We've had a lot of great uh, tenor singers coming through. Ashby Frank. Yeah, and, Ashby, uh, yep. Don Lane. Uh, man, Russell Moore came and did it one time with us. Really? We had a lot of, you know, oh, it's it's been great. Lou Reed, uh, every every great tenor man you can imagine. Just been there. coming there for a weekend, you know. and. Mm -hmm. It was really a treat for me. It was tough. It was tough though to sing with a, a new guy every weekend for mm -hmm. a year and a half. You know, because the sure. phrasing different. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. I tried to be as close to the same as I could every week. You know, but we tried to do it like like flat and scrub, but can't nobody do it exactly. No, you know? but you guys are close. You guys really are. I mean, you guys are close enough that without the scratches on the record. If you had the scratches on the record, you guys, it'd be even uh, more difficult to tell you apart. But you guys, I tell you, the last awesome. the last show the Earls did was uh, February the sec uh, the sixteenth in Knoxville of twenty twenty. Really, that was our last. Year. Yeah, you, we haven't even played since over a year now. So where'd you play? At? Did you play at the Bijou or Tennessee or something like that? The I believe it was the Bijou. Uh, pretty sure it was the Bijou. Okay, that's uh, a nice theater. Oh yeah. Now, are you in Knoxville now? Yeah, that's where I'm from. And I moved back yeah. here in. Uh, let's see, Sean. I moved back here in. Um, moved back here in in in. I think it was like uh, 2000. I got hired with with Pro, and it was just as close to Lexington from here as it was from Nashville. Yeah. So I right. thought, you know. Hopefully this job will last for a while. I was kind of dumb and moved back my first week, but it did wind up lasting. I'm there for 11 years with him. And wow. uh, then another year, we went back out. After he retired, we went back out uh, as a band called uh, Flashback. 
And uh, oh, yeah. and then now, you know, I after Crow left, I still kept the band, which was Don Rigsby, Richard Bennett, and Kurt Chapman. And uh, oh, yeah. I brought in a guy named Stuart Wyrick. And then I, I left the band to do, do, do some different things. But they're still going. But we had a really good time with Crow. But I kind of knew the last show that we'd played was going to be his last one because I saw him. I walked down the hall to go in my room and I looked up at Crow, up at Crow, back at Crow. And I was at the end of the hall and he had his banjo and he just kind of looked at me because he knew his room was all the way across the mine. And he looked at that long hall and I remember he set his banjo down and took a, a deep breath and shook his head. And he called me the next day uh, or no, not the next day, called me, that was Saturday, called me on Monday, and I was on my way to Vanderbilt because my cancer had came out They back. They had called me that morning. And wow. uh, I'm on my way. In, I'm actually walking in the door at Vanderbilt, and Crow called me and said, hey, you got a minute? And I told him I was a little late for an appointment, but, you know, what, 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 what's up? I thought it'd be something simple. And he said, hey, I'm, I'm hanging it up. And I said, wow, man, I got to call you back here as I wow. drive home. But, but I went up and saw him here a few weeks ago. He's doing really good and glad to be off the road. And uh, he, was a, he was a jewel to work with. I, I enjoyed, I enjoyed it a whole lot. But, uh, I never got to pick with him. He he was know? a hero of mine for sure, you know. And and I I mean I know him a little bit. I've met him a few times. Oh, he knows you. He's a super super <laughs> nice guy. And I I'm, I'm I've been a fan, you know. I mean since uh, the early New South there. Double O Forty Four album with Old Home Place. Oh yeah. That, that, oh yeah, man. That and that one, you know, it was funny because I'd always hear local bands and even bands I played in local we could never make that thing sound right. And then when I started playing with Crow, I didn't realize because, you know, you get in little bands, local, and everybody sings, you got baritone here, or you got a lead here, and you got tenor. Right. Well, I didn't realize in so many places how the lines crossed where Crow would come up from baritone up to the lead or what. And I thought, wow, yeah. I didn't know that. I didn't know people did that. So, uh, you know, you learn a lot of stuff like that, but Crow, uh, you know, it's funny. You know, I used to be, you know, I always admired him uh, growing up, and uh, it's pretty good when you get to know somebody, and now he's my, I can, I can really say, hey, J.D.'s my friend. And, yeah, uh, that's great. That's a good way for it to, to go there. But, well, uh, I'll tell you what, he, he learned from, uh, uh, from Jimmy Martin and <laughs> old Martin. Sure he did. Didn't put it in there, you know. I sure mean, did. To me, Jimmy Martin was a cross between Hank Williams and Jerry Lee Lewis. You yep. know, and he, yep. he was he no was doubt. wide open. You know, and uh, no doubt. A lot of people. He, he might have said things that a lot of people didn't <laughs> agree with, but he was. He, he still, said it the way he believed it. You mm -hmm. know, he, he 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 told it like it was in mm -hmm. his world. He, but, you know, so. Uh, uh, I I never had to work with him. I, I did play one show. I was a Sunny Mountain Boy one time. <laughs> really? Yeah, and uh, and he, uh, I, I enjoyed it. But, mm -hmm. uh, he never played much after that. You know, it was right, right. there to the end. Well, you know, but, uh, I, I got to be around him a lot because of JD, and uh, yeah. So I come out on a pretty good playing field. You know when. Jimmy's one of these guys, like, when you walked up to him, if he didn't know you, he, he wasn't going to give you a time of day. He was going to turn around and, and ignore you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Crow brought me and introduced me. But it was funny. He he had saw me uh, out doing something and had looked at me real funny. Well, then Crow introduces me. And uh, Crow, it was funny because Jimmy Martin saw me talking to Crow, and J.D. says... Uh, uh, Jimmy, I want you to meet a guy playing Dobro uh, for us. And Jimmy looked at me. He goes, I was going to ask where you got that big, dumbass Dobro player at. He said he was out there in the <laughs> hall all night uh, causing commotion. And, uh, and you know, I, I took it as a compliment. If you're called that by Jimmy Martin, it's a lot better than somebody calling you that in a bar, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> come from Jimmy Martin, I took it as a compliment, you know. But uh, right. 
I know we're getting close on time, but I want to I want to ask you about another thing. I want to ask you about uh, about your fiance Lauren. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, let me see if I can get her name. Is her last name Muschietti? That pronounce it. Awful close. Muschietti. 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 Okay, Masetti. I've got it. Lauren Muschietti. Yeah, she well, was, she's great. She's she's on American Idol. Yeah, she was on American Idol last year and uh, did really well. She's she's doing doing well. She's got a, an album out called uh, uh, God Made a Woman, and uh, mm-hmm. it's uh, she's done pretty well with that. She's I've heard that one. Uh, I I've, I've got to produce that album and play on it, and all the all of my buddies that have been playing with me in my little band mm-hmm. uh, for years, they they all played on it. Mike Bub. Oh yeah. Uh, Larry had a man you right. and, uh, Pete Wozner and Guthrie Trap and Jimmy Stewart played played some Dobro on it, you know. Uh but it's a great record and, and she's doing well. She's got a new video she's doing great. and uh and a new single is coming out that I produced called uh One Life Stand and uh it's uh it's gonna be good I think. Right That's awesome. You know, I always yeah. I always tell you when I see you, I said, there comes the new Georgia Tammy. Uh, oh, thank you, man. So, yeah, man, I mean that. You guys, uh, you guys, everybody, everybody, you know, if they see you, they they ask about her. If they see her, they ask about you. So, you know, that's a well, that's a good thing right there. But uh, well, I appreciate you, brother. I, you know, uh, it's. Uh, it's been it's been fun to, to write songs with each other. And sure, that's how we started hanging out, and uh, it just ended up uh, turning into uh, a, a lot more than that. You sure, know? So, yeah. Uh, but uh, um, got a new. I've got a video out on a, uh, a thing that I put music to uh, a Johnny Cash poem on this Forever Words uh, project. Oh yeah, I'm okay. Not, probably ought to tell you about that. It's. You can see that on YouTube or on Facebook or whatever. It's called "I'm Coming, Honey." It's a uh, a poem that Johnny Cash wrote in '58 wow. on a Delta Airlines stationery, and uh, no one had heard any music or anything with it. And uh, I actually put music to a couple of his poems, but uh, wow, that's cool. That thing's done pretty well. If you get a chance, check that out. But, uh, I will do that. It's uh, is it on YouTube? Or I can see it. Oh yeah, it's on okay. YouTube. It's on Johnny Cash's Facebook or okay. uh, or my book too, you know. But but I'll check that out because I know it'll be good. And uh, yeah. It, but I want I want to talk to you about two other things here. First, or three other things. Uh, you told me about that. What What are some other things you're you're working on right now? Oh. Uh, well, I've been recording stuff, writing a lot of songs during this year, you know. But uh, mm-hmm. I've, I've, I've started cutting a couple of two or three different projects, but uh, um, haven't really finished them because all of the COVID happened. Sure. You know, everybody kind of went on lockdown. But uh, I haven't done a, haven't released a, a solo project since 2006. So. I've done, you know, I had I had another band I was in called the World Famous Headliners and rock and roll band. Yeah, and sure. We made we made two albums together, and 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 that was a lot of fun. We wrote all the material for that, and then done, I don't know, three or four, I guess Earl's three, I guess. Oh, wow. Uh, but uh, it, it's time consuming. I need to I need to kind of do one on my own. I got so many songs of my own. I need to do. You do. You do. And, you know. Uh, uh, a lot of folks may not know, but you had a uh, country deal there when you first come to Nashville, uh, or, or if you've been in Nashville, because I remember seeing your videos and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, I was on Warner Brothers there for a while, yeah. and uh, uh, made a couple albums for them, but I kind of got crossways because I didn't. Uh, they wanted me to take all the fiddles and dobros off and mm-hmm. put electric guitars on it, and mm-hmm. I, you know, I just didn't. Mm. Uh, didn't set well. Me and Emory Gordy, Emory Gordy produced it, and uh, we had Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Quartet on it. Patty Loveless singing. Wow. Uh, you know James Burton, Roy Husky Jr. Mm-hmm. Had Jerry Douglas played on a little mm-hmm. bit. Uh, anyway, it laid on the shelf for seventeen years. Finally came out. Jeez. But, uh, but uh, it, they wouldn't put it out. That's why I left that, that label. But uh, started writing more songs, went to the woods, 
making up lies. You know, mm -hmm. instead of making records. But. Well, you know, I, that's the thing. I know when I when first moved to Nashville, the change was happening from uh, a lot of the music that was being played to here in the mandolin when, when Skaggs come in and started doing records. Then you started yeah. hearing all that stuff with Randy Travis, uh, had fiddles, had Mark O'Connor, uh, Mark, yeah. Mark was on, on, Mark and Jerry was on, on about everything down there. Oh at yeah. The time, you yeah. know, and it was a big time. I really liked that music during during those years and then all of a sudden it. man it just it just changed and not only did yeah. it change my stations on my radio changed uh, uh yeah uh, too. yeah i mean the ones i used to listen to that was really good stuff is stuff now that if it come on the radio i would have to run to turn it off you know uh unless it was uh josh turner's uh would you go with me or some of that stuff now i like that a lot it's not because you're on here i just you know, I like that kind of stuff, but there's not enough of that right now. And well, it had a little bluegrass in it. Did know, so. It, did. Uh, it's good. always good to hear a banjo. Yep. A lot of people don't realize some of the biggest records of all time had a banjo on. Oh sure, you know, they did. So, like "Gentle on My Mind," mm -hmm. it's, it's sure did. Huge record. Sure um, did. Uh, but uh. Well, you know, people, the, these guys now are so young. I think that come into Nashville and they don't. The only thing they've heard has been the stuff we listen to now. So, you know, everybody's Kenny Chesney on there. You got seven or eight people that sound like him, and uh, which is strange. We went to the same high school together. He, I was, he was, I think he was six years ahead of me, or, or got out six years later to me or something. But, uh, wow. you know, it's funny how all these people just try to sound alike anymore. I know, but, you know, Kenny, stuck, Kenny is a hard-working guy. Oh, yeah. That's really, he really has, was determined from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And, he, I, you know, I always liked Kenny. We actually kind of started the same year. You know? Right, uh, that's right. And uh, uh, I remember being in a huddle with him and uh, uh, Tim McGraw and, and uh, Faith Hill and, mm -hmm. and the whole slew of us kind of were right around the same time, sure. you know, and... Uh, uh, this some of us some of us didn't float to the top. <laughs> some of us floated right to the bottom. So, <laughs> well, you know, Kenny. One thing I I knew about him from living around here is uh, they said that when he graduated went to college, he told his best friends to wait on him. He'd be back and hire him. And you know, That's people. Good. People say that kind of stuff all the time, but it really worked out, you know. Yeah, he probably did. Yeah, back he did. There, all the guys I went to school what, with. One time I was sitting on Music Row looking out the window and uh, trying to write a song, and I saw this woman pull up to a stop sign at 16th Avenue right in front of Master Chronics. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, no, actually, this little pickup pulled up and stopped, and this woman rear-ended that pickup. And uh, the guy got out. Pickup, and, it, and it was Chesney in a little small baby pickup truck, <laughs> and that woman rear in me, and he and he uh, he 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 was the most sweet guy I'd ever seen in that situation. As, this as an observer, that's awesome. You know? Yeah, and that, and that was before he really hit, but it was like I saw it happen, and he jumped out of the car and was really sweet to this woman who wow. obviously didn't didn't mean to rear end me, you no, know, and. No. And he got in his truck and he went on, you know, and it was fine. It, but it was like, I told him that 20 years later, you know, and he said, I can't believe you saw that, you know. <laughs> but, I, you know, he's, 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 got, he's got a lot of good in him, too. He's sure does. Boy. Sure does. And, uh, you know, what? I, I think it's what it is with a lot of people. A lot of people see people and, you know, try to approach them or whatever when they're at the wrong time or busy or whatever. Or they hear so much stories about things, and, and I'm sure in a lot of cases some things are true, but a big portion of things you hear aren't, and uh, right. and it, it hurts it hurts these artists, and, and I know, you know, from people I know in, in the business, uh, the more, the bigger you get toward the top, the more people throw daggers at you, and... Uh, That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Anything... If you get up in front of them and do anything that's that's is positive, 
there's mm-hmm. going to be an audience of about 30 percent that's going to be irritated. Of oh, of course, you know, of course, and you're uh-huh. going to always be under a microscope, you Absolutely. know, with that. And and it's kind of it's kind of not fair, but uh, you know, I think when people decide to take this career on, I I'm, I know that. Uh, Hopefully, some of the management companies tell them what's ahead, but I guess sometimes they just throw them into the fire on this stuff yeah. and let them do it, and they make their money off of them and and release them. But uh, that's true. You know, I I've really enjoyed having you on tonight, buddy. Uh, I've got to I've got to ask uh, you to. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, buddy. No, I'm 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 just going to say I've enjoyed being here with you, man. Great to hear your voice and visit with you. A thank little you, bit. thank you, Sean. Uh, I can't wait till I can hug your neck, see you, and do some picking one of these days, man. Buddy, I got my second COVID shot yesterday that I was oh, talking great. about, and and I'd said earlier in the show that I was supposed to. Everybody said, "Oh, tomorrow you're not going to be able to get up out of bed." And I actually right. got out in the yard today and worked on on my car. I'm trying wow. to put a radio in, and uh, and I mentioned earlier. You know, uh, yeah. you don't try to go to church and then try to put a radio <laughs> in your car because I dropped stuff. I dropped stuff down in the air conditioning vents that I needed and and didn't know where oh. to get them. So uh, I got to go in with a, yeah. ma- a magnet tomorrow and try to fish some of the stuff out. But well, good luck with that, man. Uh-huh. I don't know. I don't know anything about installing radios. Well, so. I don't, well, apparently I don't either, you know. <laughs> but I know you're, you're a tough guy, and anybody that get out there and, and, uh, and do it on the day after your second COVID shot has got to be pretty pretty strong-willed. Well, so, uh, you know, I told my wife here tonight, she had asked how I'd felt today. Uh, she goes, overall, how would you feel? And I said, I felt pretty good. And I think a lot of it is, it's kind of like a scale, you know, if you have people that's never had to deal with anything, a, a right. sore arm is going to be a big deal with them. And I I right. told her, I said, you know, with everything I've been through, uh, it's just right. part part of it anymore to me. I mean, if, if I yeah. got shot in the back, I would have to say, would you look at this and see if I'm bleeding? I felt something <laughs> wet, you know, on my back. But... I got two things. Well, two things before I go with you. Uh, okay. Gary Tullock, you know Gary well. Oh, yeah, he's great. Yeah, Gary said to tell you hi. He's sorry he had to run. Now, he was uh, Jake Tullock's son, right, in the uh, That's right. Fighting Scruggs yeah. band? Man, he's a... He's, Jake was amazing, yeah. Oh, yeah, man. Uh, Gary's such a great guy, too. And, and a lot of people... He sure is. A lot of people told me his mannerisms and all is a lot like Jake's, so... That says a lot, you know, about him. But uh, oh, yeah. I'm going to let you go. But before you go, I want you to do one thing. I want you to give me a couple of, of Lester impersonations. Oh, Phil, I just want to tell you what a <laughs> what an absolute pleasure it's been here to talk to you here this evening. And I hope all all you listeners out there is listening and enjoying the show. And I uh, hope to see everybody here before too long. <laughs> that was killer. Well, Sean, thanks a lot. We're glad to have you on. And, uh, you know, I'm glad because I know I caught you at the last minute on this. So I'm glad you I appreciate were able to. wanting to, man. Oh, yeah, man. You, you're on my list, you. buddy. I made a list out of people, and that's why I called you so quick. You was in my first five people I wrote down. So Wow. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm honored to be in that list of yours. Oh, and, uh, man. Thanks for, for reaching out to me, man. It means a lot to me. Well, buddy, we'll get to see each other soon, hopefully at a bluegrass show. And uh, Absolutely. Buddy, I'll let you go. You can just hang up, and, and it'll disconnect you. So thanks, All right, thanks, well, thanks a lot, buddy. Thanks. All right. See you later. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. All right. That was, that was Sean Camp. Let me, get, let me get all this stuff off my screen. A lot of people call in, so I want to I want to talk to some of those folks. Uh, I mentioned any of you folks that's online now. Next week, I've already I'm gonna try to start lining up my guest a week early, so you know who's coming. And next week, if we have some people out there that's the uh, that's fans of uh, Restless Heart, the country band, 
my buddy John Dietrich was the drummer in that band. And I say was because he just retired, but he was a founding member when all those guys put that band together. And John's an awesome guy. I know he'll have some good stories, but I know we've got a lot of Restless Heart fans on there. And uh, anyway, let's go through some of this. Some of the people have called in a little bit. Barney, Barney Rogers, that's my buddy right there. Great writer. He said, great show, Sean. And uh, Marsha Blackburn, Rogish, Missing the Earls. Uh, how, that's how I wanted to see both of you. Hey, all right. Glad to have you on, on tonight. Uh, Cindy Barrier Chapman, hey, Sean. Let's go on down through here. Some uh, still not used to having this uh, lapel mic. I keep hitting it. Sorry about that. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Kimberly Ann Tamola Mealy, I think's right. She said uh, uh, got pandemic hair too. So yeah, we've all got that. And let's see what else we've got here. Uh, Let's see if there's anything we need to holler out there on. Uh, Den Denise Colson said the last music show she got to attend was the Earls of Leicester at Mount Airy. I tell you what, if you've not seen them, when all this is over with, you need to uh, go check it out because they're, they're an awesome band. And uh, Greg English was on tonight. My buddy from high school, Greg Pruitt, said I saw Sean four different times in Knoxville. And he's been great every time. Can't wait to see him again and, and can't count how many times I've seen you, Phil. Oh, yeah, you've seen me a bunch. Uh, but he's one of my buddies, Greg Pruitt. He's on there again. Last show I was definitely at the Bijou. And let's see. Anyway, we've got a whole bunch of different things. I, I want to be able to... Uh, uh, I ain't gonna be able to read all these tonight. Sean, Sean's pretty popular. He's got a lot, a lot of responses, so I have to check them out. But uh, you know, I want to, want to thank you guys. I appreciate everyone that tuned in last week to the show. Uh, you know, I don't always do music. I do other things sometimes. And last week I had a uh, uh, Pro Hall of Fame WWF WWE wrestler uh, Ricky Steamboat on. And uh, we had a good time, Ricky, but about two hours telling all these stories that uh, just kind of, uh, you know, kind of are, were amazing. Uh, a lot of things behind the scenes on wrestling that you didn't know, uh, things that we suspected, but but they were verified by him. And, uh, you know, I like, I like bringing in people that's interesting. We've had a lot of response on Rodney Dillard that was here. Uh, you know, Rodney was part of the uh, Dillards, but he was part of the, uh, you know, the Darling family on the Andy Griffith show. And, uh, you know, I've already talked to him. He's wanting to do it again. So I'm going to try to get him back on. He's been very popular, but I've got a good, really good list of people that, that I'm going to approach to uh, have on the show. And I want to thank all you folks for tuning in tonight. And I got a few things that I want to uh, to ask about. I've made myself a note here on on a few of the things. Um, let's see. You yeah, know, I can't even write my own, read my own writing, so I can give up on that. I don't even know what I wrote. I wrote something, but say again. You know what I do after I'm on here. I usually take these programs down and move them to my YouTube channel. So if you want to see a, a replay of this, you can go to Phil Ledbetter uh, channel, and uh, there it is. So, <coughs> sorry about blowing your ears off at that. I should have covered up. But uh, I wanted to ask you folks, you know, uh, I've got a, a good buddy, of a big music friend of all of ours, uh, a great banjo player named Patton Wages. Patton plays with... a uh, volume five and uh he's really not doing well right now he's in the hospital and it's it's not covid he's had some other some major stuff happen to him uh and uh surgeries and 
stuff and and I just hope you'll you'll pray for him and his family. Uh, Patton's a really good guy and a great banjo player and we we need him to stay around so I hope that you'll send up some prayers for our buddy Patton and uh, like I said next week it'll be on here so come and join us and I'm gonna get on out of here. You guys have a great night. Thanks for tuning in as always and uh, I want to try to keep this show entertaining so we can keep getting you back. So thanks again for joining in and good night.